What's going on, everybody? Welcome to today's Seven Figures Club podcast. And today, my friends, we did walk into the new studio, so hopefully the videos are working here. But more importantly, we've got an exceptional guest for you. We have Ernie Parker, who is an entrepreneur, as you're going to find out in the next few minutes, someone who serves his community, someone who serves his dream clients. And as we know, most of us here at this podcast, you know, that are listening, we're entrepreneurs, we're startups, we're side hustlers, we're trying to build a business and get into the seven figures club where we can earn seven figures annually. And only about, as we know, five, six, seven percent of businesses ever get there. Today's guest, Ernie Harker, is someone who's going to help you get there. He is an entrepreneur. He started a creative production studio called uh, Eight Fish in 1995. Did I get that right, Ernie? It's yep, you got fish, it. Right? Yeah, after working as an illustrator and designer for a large ad agency called uh, Dallin Smith White based in Salt Lake City. So he's not far from us here in Utah. A Fish became well known for animation, video production, writing, directing, and branding among ad agencies and dozens of direct clients such as Maverick, one of the largest uh, gas station convenience stores in the entire country, Extra Space Shelf, uh, Seaforce Water, Rocky Mountain Yeti, Bountiful Moss, and so many others. Now, Ernie's an interesting uh, talent who loves to draw and write. Uh, he also wrote and illustrated Monster Factory, How to Draw Adorable Monsters, published by Impact Media, available on Amazon. He also wrote and illustrated a children's book. We need better children's <laughs> authors, so he is helping our children. Thank you for that, Ernie. And he's also a travel TV host while producing a reality TV series for Maverick convenience stores. He was inspired to produce and host a travel show focused on discovering adventures. And he's an Ironman athlete recently completing an Ironman uh, in uh, Cozumel. And he clarified for me that Ironman means three mile swim, 110 mile bike ride, capped off with 26.2 marathon run. So unbelievable, Ernie, welcome to the show. There are over 32 million businesses in the US and over 90% of them will never break seven figures in annual sales. So how do we as entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs break into that seven figures club? This podcast will relentlessly share the secrets, strategies, and tactics I've used to create three multi seven figures businesses and bring in even more successful entrepreneurs than me to share their inspirational stories and tactics to success. You can create your dream business in life right now. So buckle up and let's go. Thank you so much for having me, buddy. Now, the first thing we like to find out with a lot of our guests, Ernie, is what, what kind of makes them tick? What was it? Uh, who was Ernie in 10th, 11th, 12th grade in high school as he's growing up, learning his ways and trying to find a path? What do you think during that time period maybe led you towards a path of entrepreneurship? That's super, super interesting question. When I was a little kid, I was, I was tiny. In seventh grade, I weighed 72 pounds. In eighth grade, I weighed 84 pounds. Ninth grade, 90. The reason I know these weights is because that's the weight I wrestled. Okay? Oh, okay. So I was microscopic. And uh, I also had eight brothers. So I'm right in wow. the middle of this really big family. And my, um, my, older brothers, like Sean, number two brother, was academic All-American, 4-0 student, started football, started basketball. I mean, he was wow. everything. He was a genius. Super, super smart. Uh, my older brother, Maurice, um, always competed in the state championships in wrestling, just super aggressive. He's also brilliant and a violin player. So you've got these older brothers. I've got these older brothers that are highly exceptional. And so, and I'm the scrawny kid trying to make my way. And one of the things I found that I was really good at was drawing. And so that was, that became my, my, uh, my difference, my uniqueness, my specialty. And uh, my mom was awesome at kind of helping and coach and encourage that budding desire. And so when start, people start saying, hey, man, you're a really good artist. You're a really good artist. Boy, finally, I got something that people would notice me about because it was not my physique. Okay. No one was looking. No chicks were interested in the 72-pound seven, uh, seventh grader. No. So 
Um, but the girls liked the cool drawings, right? So anyway, Absolutely. Um, I had a, uh, when I was in junior high, phenomenal uh, teacher, Bob Beeson, that was a comic book artist. And he had a professional illustrator come into uh, our after class uh, workshop. And he showed his portfolio and told us what he did for a living. And I'm like, you can draw for a living? I'm in. I'm 100% in. So that became my passion. Like from that, that was the time I realized I was going to be a professional artist. And so I pursued that career, um, went to school at Utah State to, uh, to learn to be an artist. Um, and I got a job right out of college working for uh, Dolan Smith White ad agency. They were really, really encouraging. They, they thought I was really good. And I did that for two years. But for some reason, and I doubled my salary in two years. That was awesome, right? So went from $22,000 a year, which was pretty good in 1993, to like 45 grand two years later. But I wanted to do my own thing. And so, and I don't know where that came from. I don't, I don't know where that desire came from. It just felt like I didn't want to, I guess I like the free, so the idea. Were, were of you the guy that was, that was selling the baseball cards or going door to door in high school or anything like that? No, had a paper out. Yeah. But, okay. Uh, hey, that's, I think a yeah. lot of entrepreneurs actually start with that paper route. Yeah. I did. Um, when I was in high school, I started a t-shirt company. Okay. So I could do there, my artwork there. and put it on t-shirts yeah. and my that, mom would help go another around and get to places. Real step. Totally. Totally. Now that you recognize, or you mentioned that's like, oh yeah, I totally did that stuff. Um, and, uh, but it wasn't until like, uh, like after I, I served an LDS mission to, to Ireland Yeah, and I was still really interested in art at that time too. And in Ireland, uh, Don Bluth, had a animation studio out there, an American tale. He did the American tale, the secret of Nim. Um, oh, I, I, Land Before I saw Time. Those <laughs> okay. So I was able to go during one of my off days and I, I was given 15 minutes to be at this animation studio and talk to one of the directors. Well, that 15 minutes turned into an hour and a half. And I'm like, I'm so sold on being a professional artist, but it's hard to figure out like, where to start? Um, like, who's going to buy your art? You know, how do you, how do you get into that? And so, going into, uh, I think, I had an ad agency. So, some my mom knew somebody in the ad agency business that needed an illustrator, and that was my that was my in. I did a great job in my first interview and showed them my portfolio, and I was off to the races. So, so in high school, there, there you were, you, not a lot of uh, options until you figured out, you know, one of your strong suits, which yeah. is art, artistry, the yeah. ability to draw, the ability to create amazing things that starts to get your attention. And now you realize, hey, this is something that you can bring value to the world in, go to college, get out, get a job, get a better job, double your income. Now, what is it that makes you believe, okay, I can go out on my own. I can be an entrepreneur. I can be a business owner. I don't have to work for someone. How did you get the courage to take that leap? When I was at Dawn Smith White, when I was, as an employee of Dawn Smith yeah. White, I was doing storyboards for them. They would hire other storyboard artists from Los Angeles, fly them up to Salt Lake City, and they would basically pay them a daily rate to do their artwork for sometimes three days, maybe seven days when we're working on a really big pitch, really big project. And I learned that my work was just as good as theirs. And I was like two years, you know, like, well, my first year as a professional, I had creative directors and art directors at Dolan Smith White, the agency that would say, Ernie, you're as good as these guys are. And so that my confidence level in being at par with those guys was good. They were charging 500 bucks a day plus their expenses. And I'm like, I don't even make 500 a week. So if I was to leave, the worst case scenario is like work one day a week 
and me make my salary. But if I could make, if I work two days a week, oh man, I'd, I'd be living the dream. So I think that comparison of like what freelancers and independent people were able to earn uh, that was different and so much better than an employee that, oh, that tempted me like crazy. I wasn't the security of having a full-time job. I didn't value as much, but I liked the earning potential of an independent uh, worker. And so, yeah, that, that was a great choice. I remember my father-in-law saying, what is wrong with you? This is the stupidest choice you'll ever make. You're going to leave this great <laughs> job of stability and revenue, you know, this, this monthly guaranteed income and to start your own business. This is ridiculous. And so, yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. So that, that's tough when you've got some, you know, some naysayers, some doubters there within the family. So, yeah. so what was that first business like? How did yeah. you generate clients and uh, what lessons or, or struggles did you learn along the way? Well, the first thing I did, um, I did not anticipate having any work from the agency I was currently working for when I left, but they hired me like on projects a ton because when I left, they didn't have anybody to replace me. Yeah. Um, so they would hire me Well, with my new day rate and they were totally cool, totally cool with paying me the freelance rate. No problem. Cause they were actually billing their client for that. So, and then I would have like, I remember this uh, production manager, I can't tell his name cause he might get in trouble, but um, he would call me up and say, Hey, Ernie, we need you to do this finished illustration for the cover of this, like uh, this magazine or this sales brochure or whatever. And uh, I would say, um, yeah, that's going to be 800 bucks. And he goes, no, it's not. And then he'd kind of give me the thumb up. Like, mm -hmm. I'd say a uh, thousand dollars. He goes, no, it's not. And he'd give me the thumbs up and I'd go, it's going to be about 1200 bucks. And he goes, that sounds about right. I'm like, dude. And he would do that so many times to kind of coach me along the way to help me to kind of realize where my prices should be. So that when other people asked for art, I would have a, 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 a sense of position, a, a, like a baseline of where it should be at. But he was able to give me that coaching because he dealt, he had dealt for like 15 years in the art buying world. So he used that because I was, I guess he liked me and he wanted me to succeed. And so he was, he was very helpful in that. Um, so kind yeah. of an acted as an early mentor, uh, yeah. perhaps in fair market value and, and what your worth is and, and the work yeah. and that that's super important. So how important do you think it is for you know yourself and your history and looking at other entrepreneurs to have a mentor, someone that you can kind of you know look to, to, to get feedback? I, I don't know how you do it without some kind of a mentor. And I wish I had mentors in other aspects of my business. I had it in art and production, but I never had it in brand development. I never had it in speaking. Uh, I never had it in television production. Um, and I wish I had those things. Uh, I didn't have a business. My dad was a CFO and yet he never talked to me about money. And so my first year of being independent at the end of the year, there was this thing called income tax, you know, and business tax that um, uh oh guys, I'm business like, taxes what? are due today, by the way, <laughs> holy crap. It, it, floored me. And, uh, I'm like, how in the world am I going to come up with this kind of money, uh, to pay taxes? But I, I wish I had other, um, um, mentors, but because of that experience, I have been very eager to, to be a mentor for other people because of how valuable it was for me growing up or kind of getting into the business. And, uh, what's interesting is like, as a young person, I was always intimidated and scared to reach out to someone and ask, Hey, I'd like to learn more about your business from you being in that position. Now I relish the opportunity to share a little bit of insight or experience to somebody who could actually use it and appreciate it. Uh, and so it's weird to not 
I mean, as a young person to look ahead, look, look to these people and say, oh, they, they're too busy. They don't have time for me. They wouldn't want to spend time with me. Um, and, the, and it's really not that true. That's a lie we tell ourselves that people who know better are selfish and self-important. And I, I, I think most times people who have a, a lot of experience are very happy to share that experience with others. Well, and especially when it comes to entrepreneurship, like if you're in a similar field and there's someone who's 10 years ahead of you and has accomplished so much, but they see that, you know, you've got this burning drive to do something similar in a unique way and, and you reach out to them. And, and I think that the first key is you don't reach out just immediately asking, asking, but hey, is there, what can I do for you? And then if you mm-hmm. show that, then they're almost always willing to help and yeah. give back because at some point someone probably helped them along the way as well. Ernie, I'm yeah. curious, you've, you've got a, it sounds like a 30 year career now within marketing, branding, uh, sounds like video production, which yeah. has become more important now than yeah. ever. Could you have imagined it? What has this transition been and how different is branding and marketing now? Uh, and what's that uh, evolution been over the last 30 years, would you say? I, that's a great question. Um, one of the things I noticed though, is in like video, when I first started in the ad agency business 30 years ago, doing video production was out of reach. You just, nobody could do it unless you were like a gazillionaire because the, the equipment costs and the editing costs and stuff like that were so enormous, but now you can use it with a freaking phone. We do amazing production with a, with a phone. But um, branding to me has changed a little bit in that when I first started doing brand development, it was kind of a hit a moving target. It was, it was a graphic design approach. And so what would happen is I'd meet with a client and the client would say, hey, we need a brand. And what they're really thinking is I need a logo and a website and a, you know, a business card, letterhead, stuff like that. And they'd say, hey, this is the kind of stuff I like. And I would develop some, some designs, see if they liked it. What would happen is that they would kind of like it. And then they'd show it to their niece or their uncle or their wife or whatever. And then you'd get all these various opinions about what's good and what's not in this brand. That drove me bonkers. I hated that because I, I could never pin them down. They would just change their opinion, uh, change their minds or what's important, what's not important. So I thought, okay, I've got to change this because this is driving me nuts. So I said, let's build a brand strategy first. And then let's develop the brand attributes or the, uh, the brand uh, elements like a logo and colors and fonts and stuff like that based on the brand strategy. Because if the brand strategy is this, it's, it's very simple. Who's your customer? What makes you different? What makes you special? And how would you want your, your, your business to be described to somebody, your, your core, co- core audience? Um, and then list some adjectives that describe that, that personality. Well, now, if that's already nailed down and somebody says, um, hey, you know, let's do some logos for this and choose colors and whatever. Well, if your brand was described that you want to be described as warm, friendly, soft, uh, et cetera, right? Uh, red, your favorite color will not work because red does not mean soft, friendly, you know, warm. It means hot, aggressive, and that's color psychology. So basically what I would do is I'd go, okay, what is your brand strategy? Now with the brand strategy in place, I can now bring brand assets that already have predetermined emotional context to those, that brand strategy. So if you want to be, you know, um, uh, light, fun, uh, happy, juvenile, well, you're probably going to look for saturated, bright, pastel colors. Uh, you're looking at simplicity, you, you know, because those are the kinds of things that are ascribed to that brand description. So now if someone says, well, I don't like red. Uh, 
yet you've described your brand to be aggressive, assertive, bold, take no prisoners. And your favorite color is pink. I can say, how does pink or violet convey that sense of aggressiveness that you want? And oftentimes they'll go, well, then I don't want to have my brand be aggressive. That's fine. Totally fine. If you, that's because that's it's your brand, it's your personality, whatever. Let's just make sure that the brand attributes that we create for you and we assemble for you, like curate for you, are in line with the image and personality you want your company to, to portray. So that's, that's been the biggest difference. Brand strategy first, not graphic design exercise first. I like that. Guys, let's let's unpack a little bit about what Ernie just uh, laid out for us. When you're developing a brand strategy, you begin not with all of the stuff that you think matters about color and building out the brand, but it starts with your customer. It starts, starts with your client. Who are you targeting? And as always, if you're targeting everyone, you're targeting no one. You have to be very specific <laughs> in the demographics. Who are you targeting? Who is your dream client? What does that avatar look like? And then once you decide on that, then, well, what is it that sets you apart? What is your competitive advantage, yep. as, uh, as Ernie would say, as a Tony Robbins might say? And when you can define that competitive advantage, and it should be able to should be off the top of your tongue. Yes. I remember I was sitting uh, last year at an event uh, with Tony Robbins. He's out there speaking. He brings his financial advisor on stage. He's like, hey, tell me your competitive advantage. Why should I do business with you versus the you know, million financial advisors out there? And, and he said, oh, we're full of integrity and we care about you and we you know, have great financial products. But there was nothing unique about yeah. what he said. And yet he'd been pretty successful. So it's pretty amazing. But everybody who makes a massive difference is very uh, good at developing that competitive advantage. And you can see right away, uh, you know, on, on Ernie's website here that he's a brand consultant, that he's got a unique way of explaining how to build and develop a successful brand. He's also a keynote speaker. Probably most brand consultants are not keynote speakers. He's also an author. Again, most branding experts are probably not authors. So these are other little things that you can add that set yourself apart. And then there are colors, they're the way that you describe things. And then, so what is that brand? There, there's the logo with your brand. What are some of the other aspects uh, that you actually physically, tangibly kind of build out in addition uh, to kind of the logo and maybe color scheme of, of what you do? So here's, here's you, you got my website up behind you. So I, you can talk, you're talking to me and you know, I'm a freaking fireball. I am like, I'm not passive. I am not calm. I'm never calm. And so um, the reason I chose the colors I use is because black is a very, very professional uh, premium color. Black and white are often associated with premium. Uh, I use red because red is highly energetic. Yellow is a friendly color. So I'm a fun, friendly, highly energetic, highly passionate person. Use black to offset those, those colors. That's, so that's my color scheme. Well, the fonts I use are clean, contemporary, and bold. So I use those fonts because those, those also describe the brand that I want to be perceived as. So we've got colors, fonts, and then uh, graphics, uh, you know, a layout. That's an illustration I did of a flame, uh, you know, a match striking. And uh, I titled my book, Your Brand Sucks, subtitle, How to Ignite a Brand That Doesn't. So I'm using language, vocabulary to reinforce this earn, burn brand. So everything I do, I pass through what I call a brand lens. First thing you do is you kind of say it straight. What do I want to say? Okay, now how do I flavor that statement in the language of my brand? So that when someone reads it or sees it, they go, oh, that's totally something that was beyond brand for, for Earn Burn. Um, Maverick, the convenience store chain. If you're from Utah, you know Maverick. You know Maverick. And there's so much. I mean, I worked on that brand for 20 years. I started the Adventures First Stop brand from, it used to be like a cowboy brand. And so everything went through this adventure lens. Instead of, uh, 
Instead of the the loyalty club, we call it the adventure club. Uh, Mm. You don't earn points. You earn trail points on your trail to rewards. I mean, everything was was done that way. Textures for signage. Uh, The wallpaper inside of a Maverick store is like you're walking into and the outdoor adventures. It wasn't just white or colored paint. We wanted people to experience the outdoor adventure when they walk into a store. So it creates a different environment or different atmosphere. So every, everything and, your and customer you sees do. touches. Well, thank my, you. My kids love walking into those Mavericks and, and getting some food or going to the bathroom because it's, it's like an experience. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. like you're going into something unique and then this isn't your your average typical, you know, gas station convenience store, the Maverick brand is, is bigger. It's more epic and certainly a lot more colorful. And yeah, you're in like, you know, one of those local areas, maybe it's uh, the arches in, in Moab or it's a, yeah. uh, you know, a national park in Utah. And it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Here's and, something and that's interesting. Experience you want to get. Yeah. 95% of the stuff that Maverick sells is exactly the same stuff as Sinclair sells. Hmm. Same Cokes. Same smokes, same beer, same candy bars, same Cheetos, everything. Yet Maverick has about 25% more business than they should. Is it because our bottled water tastes better? Our Snickers tastes better? Nope. There's something about the experience that flavors the products. A Snicker bar does taste better at Maverick because you just bought it in an adventure. Coffee. Those people who drink coffee, people love coffee more when they're drinking it on a morning sunrise, when they're out hunting ducks or whatever. They're on the lake, they're drinking coffee, and they're like, man, life doesn't get better than this. It's not coffee, you know, just in your car that makes it great. It's the experience. And so we as brands can bring that experience to our audience and make whatever product we're selling way better than just the product. All right, you guys. So the first thing is you've got to get his book. It's called Your Brand Sucks. How do you infuse a brand with charisma and emotional appeal? And you'll notice he's actually helped build a $3 billion retail brand here. So he knows what he's talking about when it comes to branding. Um, And let's talk about how, let's talk about a listener right now, Ernie, who's listening and saying, geez, I haven't even considered my color schemes. I hadn't realized how important it was to really get that associated with my marketing material, my website, mm-hmm. my social media, et cetera. Where is a good place for them to start? So if they want to, you know, be able to work with someone like you, if they want to be able to, you know, get their brand on point and grow it into, you know, what they want to grow it into. Well, there's a, I, I actually produced a, um, a brand guide for mm-hmm. that's free. Anybody can download it. and it basically walks them through a clips notes version of my book. And then it asks uh, questions to help help the, you know, I call them the client, but help the business owner or the marketing director for that, that business determine what it is about their brand that is different. Um, how, do they, how do they describe their brand? How would they describe their core customer? So I actually list out questions to help them answer those, make those statements. And then at the end, um, uh, uh, you know, they can, they either have a brand strategy that they can just kind of follow out or, or they can go, man, you know what? It's hard doing my own therapy on myself because it is kind of a lot like therapy. Um, I need to reach out to somebody and just find like a, you know, talk to one of your, your favorite business people that have a great brand and ask them, Hey, where did you, where, who did you use to, to develop your brand? Um, I do a little bit of consulting, not a ton. Um, I do a little bit of consulting, but um, there are some other like really good organizations out there that, that understand branding well. So, but, but strategy first, graphic design later. Outstanding. So guys, the website is very short, very easy to get to. It's earn, burn, E-R-N, burn.com. And then if you click on the consulting button, you can literally mm-hmm. download your brand development guide. Was that the guide that you were talking about? Yes, that, that is the guide. Questions? 
you've done such a great job of like showing them where to find it. Well, Thank we, you. We want to make it interactive and easy, guys. So awesome. go to earnburn, E R N B U R N dot com and click on consulting. You can download your brand development guide right there. You can get your brand audited and actually have mm -hmm. the opportunity to speak yeah. with with Ernie. And and yeah. this is this is what it takes. And yeah, I'd, I'm instead, totally fine with giving a, an hour. Like if someone called up and said, "Hey, look, I just want you to talk to me for a second. No problem. No strings attached. Talk to him for an hour because I'll start asking the questions to get their their ball going in the right direction. Absolutely, guys. Guys, get your brand right build the right foundation. The problem that we have is we always think, you know, we can just figure all these things out, spend all this time to become an expert. We don't have to. We can work with someone like Ernie, who has nearly three decades of experience building multi-billion dollar uh, retail brands out there and captivate, let him go to work for us and create that brand that we want and need to create our dream business, to serve our clients at a higher level, to have uh, create an epic life for our family, all the things that really matter but it starts by having a cohesive brand with everything uh, stacked together on the right foundation. So guys, make sure you can go to earnburn.com, E-R-N-B-U-R-N.com and, and take action. Again, we, he shared a lot of value today. He shared experience. He shared real solutions. Now it's on you to take action and make it happen for your business. Well, Ernie, it's been an amazing experience here and we've enjoyed you know, getting to know you and more, more importantly, understanding how we can build our brand, uh, take advantage of your book and your guides at earnburn.com. What's the final word of advice or action that you would give the audience, you know, today? Uh, pursue what it is you love the most, whatever it is that, that brings you um, joy, that gets you up in the morning, pursue that. There's, there's a way to make some money. You may not be billionaires. You may not be a gazillionaire. But I tell you what, a life lived uh, pursuing something that you truly enjoy, even if you make 100 grand a year, you, you know, basically pay the bills. Boy, I'd rather spend that 10 years making 100 grand a year than making 250,000 a year, a million a year doing something that makes me miserable because you will never get those 10 years back. Amen, guys. Well, that, that's it, guys. Find something you love, something you're passionate about, something that makes a difference. And oftentimes that is related to building your own yeah. business. Some people, there's an old adage, I'd rather work 80 hours a week for myself than 40 hours a week for someone else. So take mm -hmm. action, find something you love, go to earnburn.com. Make sure you get that uh, guide downloaded. My goodness, you can actually schedule a phone call with Ernie himself. That's an amazing value add. Yeah. Take action, guys, and we'll see you on the next Seven Figures Club podcast. Are you looking for more Seven Figure Secrets content or even how you can launch your own recession-proof business? Then check out sevenfigures.com. That's the digit seven, F-I-G-U-R-E-S.com, where we share more videos, stories, strategies, funding solutions, entrepreneurial education, and even the secret business type that's recession-proof. Thank you for listening, and if you're finding value in our podcast, please give us a five-star and invite others to join the club.